Paper number two in our series on sprinting biomechanics is an oldie. This is, I think, the oldest paper that we will cover in class, uh, published in 1925. So not, not quite 100 years old, but coming up here a little bit while on, on 100 years old here for this paper, um, titled The Physiological Basis of Athletic Records. Um, this is by a fellow named Professor A.V. Hill. The A.V. stands for Archibald Vivian. And I wanted to spend a little bit of time on him. Um, he's this dapper looking fellow that I pulled up on Wikipedia here. Um, A.V. Hill is one of the most famous and important figures in the history of physiology and, and kinesiology and uh, muscle mechanics and biomechanics. Um, he's to date the only person who most biomechanists would classically consider a biomechanist who's won a, a Nobel Prize, which is kind of the uh, cer certainly one of the top uh, prizes you can receive for international recognition of, of the quality of your work in science and pro probably the number one international prize you can receive over, over a career um, as a scientist for that. Um, won that prize in 1922 um, with a, another giant in the field, Meyerhoff, um, for his work on uh, connecting the mechanical elements of how muscle produces force to the energetic elements, the thermodynamic elements of how muscle produces force. So he was a foundational figure um, in explaining mechanistically how skeletal muscle actually works at, at that scale of, of investigation. Um, Hill also um, had a keen interest in exercise and in uh, sports. He was a, an avid runner himself, and um, he did some of the earliest studies on limitations to human performance during exercise. Um, he had a very long career. He was active as a scientist from like the late 1910s up until he retired at like age 80 or so in the late 1960s. And especially early in his career, he did quite a bit of work on uh, um, in, in, inferring how muscle and properties of muscle um, limit human performance at, uh, at exercises of various intensities and various durations. So he was, um, among his many accomplishments, was one of the founding figures of a, a lot of uh, paradigms in exercise physiology that are still around today about 100 years later. Um, for example, it says, and I highlight here in his Wikipedia, he showed that running a dash, so like a short uh, intense burst of max effort, like 100 meter dash or so, relies on energy stores, which afterwards are replenished by increased oxygen consumption. Um, this is the notion of oxygen debt that you might have been taught about in uh, exercise physiology, or, or if you're into uh, sports yourself and play sports yourself, you've probably uh, witnessed yourself, where if you do like a short burst of activity, like a 100 meter dash or like, a, you know, like some suicide drills in basketball or whatever, um, afterwards you're, you're bent over on your knees and you're huffing and puffing. Um, what's happening there is that while you were doing that short, intense burst of activity, you were producing mechanical output with your muscles, which required fuel that was greater than the rate at which you were able to supply oxygen to your muscles to, to, to provide that fuel. Okay? Um, so your muscles were kind of cash and checks that your bank account couldn't, uh, couldn't supply there. And so you were going into what's called oxygen debt. And it sounds like a bad thing. I like, go, oh, no, they're in oxygen debt. What's wrong with them? Um, this is a normal thing. It's a, it's a, it's a normal, healthy part of, of human exercise physiology. And what's happening is that you are able to fuel your muscles with fuels beyond what you're able to supply at that time with your oxygen consumption. And so afterwards, you need to replenish that debt that you went into. And so that's why when you do something like a 100 meter dash, you're, you're, you're bent over for a little bit huffing and puffing to increase your oxygen consumption and replenish that, uh, that debt of oxygen, that debt of energy expenditure that you went into. Um, my exercise physiology colleagues, so like actual professional exercise physiologists, not armchair physiologists like me, um, tell me that this is still this notion of oxygen debt um, 100 some years later is still generally accepted as, as fact today and is still something that's taught in, in undergrad uh, exercise physiology. So just kind of demonstrating the, the, the breadth and scope of his work, A.B. Hill's work, and, and some of uh, the, the many topics that, that he uh, did a, a great deal of, of important work on. Um, the paper here, The Physiological Basis of Athletics Records, is uh, probably more suited overall to uh, the first section of class on running or the, or the section on class coming up on uh, cycling. Um, since we have an exam on Friday coming up tomorrow, if anyone's keeping up like day by day on all these lectures, I thought I'd uh, just give you a short one here. So this one will be uh, pretty brief. There's really just one key passage here on uh, relevant to sprinting and relating to what I highlighted in the previous lecture on what is it categorically that limits sprinting speed uh, that, that Hill covers here that I wanted to highlight. So all, all of this paper is, is interesting and relevant. It's a very uh, cool paper. The analysis that he does here is, is still around today and is, is a common way for uh, individuals to infer like what physiologically dictates performance or limits performance in, in different types of exercise. Um, but the, the part that's relevant for sprinting is down here. 
few pages down on, I believe, page 8 of the physical document and I think page 415 or so of the actual paper. Yeah, here it is, uh, where he says limits of the argument. So prior to this, based on um, the data that he gathered here on the uh, duration of particular events in human uh, locomotor competitions, so like running, uh, swimming, cycling, rowing, um, the duration of those events in terms of how long they take and the average speed that uh, the, the, the current world record holder is, is able to sustain over those, those durations, um, he inferred uh, from this and based on his knowledge of, of muscle mechanics and human physiology, um, what it is that limits human performance in terms of uh, why we can't go even faster, why the world record is about what it is um, based on, on human physiology. What is it that's, that's physiologically limiting our performance and providing kind of the cap on, on what's the best possible uh, performance that, that a human body can do. Um, so here he then uh, goes over some limitations of that argument. What, what are the circumstances where this argument of the uh, rate of delivery of energy being critical and, and limiting our performance, um, what are particular situations where that wouldn't apply? And so he starts off here, and I'll quote, um, It is obvious that we must not pursue that argument too far. A man cannot exhaust himself completely in a 100 or 200 yard race. And you can kind of notice this yourself, right? If you're if you're at all into uh, to running or to, to performing, you know, swimming or cycling or you know sports where you can compete and and exert yourself over a variety of distances and time durations. If you do like a marathon or even like a 5K at a true maximum effort, at the end of that effort, you are spent, you are exhausted, and even just like standing up and and standing still and like doing a crossword puzzle or something like that would be extremely taxing and exhausting. You probably wouldn't be able to, to function too well at, at those even basic tasks after an effort at over a 5K distance, let alone a marathon distance, if it's truly a maximum effort. Um, even doing something uh, requiring any amount of substantial physical exertion after that would, would basically be impossible if you wanted to do it at a high level. Um, that's not really the case for shorter efforts though, right? For sprint type efforts. Like if you do a, a hundred meter dash all out, yeah, it's hard. Yeah, you're tired for a little bit at the end, but you're not exhausted, right? You could get up and, and go jog around a little bit and, and be just fine. You could rest for a little bit and go do another hundred meter dash, you know, later that day or even just a few minutes later. And maybe you wouldn't be exactly as fast as the first time you did it, but you wouldn't be too far off, right? So it's not an exhausting task. It's not a task where you're truly expending and, and, and exhausting all of your energy stores available to your muscle. Okay? So he argues here that for efforts longer than roughly about 50 seconds, the maximum speed that you can sustain is limited by the metabolic aspects, the availability of energy for fueling those muscle actions. Okay? For shorter events, for efforts shorter than about 50 seconds, and for like 100 meter dash here, for a very fast person, we'd be talking like 10 seconds. For a slow person, we'd be talking like 20 seconds. For you know 200 meter dash, maybe 20 seconds for a fast person, 30, 40 seconds for a slow person. So, so kind of short sprints here. Um, there, we're not going to be limited by the amount of energy available. And so sort of by process of elimination here, he argues that we're going to be limited by other factors that determine your maximum possible speed or the maximum human speed in events here, efforts here of max efforts lasting below about 50 seconds, such as human sprinting. Um, factors such as mechanics, um, how much power can your muscles produce, how much work can your muscles produce in a short amount of time? How quickly can you develop large forces to support your body weight and, and propel your body forward? Um, how efficiently can you translate those muscle actions to the external forces, the ground reaction forces that actually move your center of mass around? Or what about uh, nervous factors here? And here he's not referring to like uh, nervousness, like, like psychological nervousness. Here he's referring to uh, the nervous system, neural factors. Um, how, how quickly can you uh, excite your muscles, right? How can, can you recruit uh, the, the, the necessary muscles with the proper coordination pattern to get the muscle mechanics that you need? 
Um, can you truly, or, or to what extent can you truly maximally activate your muscles? Can you, can you really call on all of the actual mechanical reserves of your muscles when you need them or, or maybe not so much? So other factors here, he argues, uh, beyond the, the, the energetic, the metabolic side of things, um, dictate performance or, or limit performance in short sprinting events, mechanical factors and uh, neural factors. And so just kind of highlighting one of the main things that we will focus on here in uh, the sprinting section of class, that it's largely mechanical factors at the muscle level, at the joint level, at the limb level, the whole body level that are important and that we can learn something from in terms of what limits uh, maximum speed in short sprint type events. Okay, like I said, this will be a short one. That is it for today. Um, today is Thursday. Don't forget there's an exam uh, tomorrow. Um, the exam will open up at midnight tonight, so like midnight Friday, technically, and then will be open um, until 11.59 um, p.m. on Friday, so, so j just to touch under uh, 24 hours. Um, you can start the exam on Canvas at uh, any time within that window, and whenever you start it, you get two hours from that time to finish it. So a couple things to keep in mind. Um, once you start it, the two-hour clock starts running and doesn't stop. If you start it and then leave and come back, if two hours total have elapsed, you're, you're sunk. You can't start it for like an hour and then stop and come back two hours later and, and do the other hour. It's got to be the whole uh, two hours all, all, all at once. Um, also, you can't continue on past 11.59 p.m. Friday if you start the exam very late. Um, you get at most two hours to take it but it closes at 11.59 p.m. regardless of, of how much time you've taken, even if it's not the full two hours. So just be aware, if you start it at like 11 o'clock tomorrow night, you only get 59 minutes to, to finish it. You don't get two hours. It closes at uh, 11.59 regardless of when you started it. So if you want the full hour, if you want the full two hours, you got to start it um, at least uh, two hours before 11.59 p.m. Uh, if you're an ADS student, for example, and if you get time and a half, meaning you get three hours, then you need to start at least three hours before 11.59 p.m. if you want to, to, to have your full uh, allowed time available. Um, it's not intended to be a difficult exam. It's not intended to be a hard exam. I'd be really surprised if anyone actually needs uh, two hours for it. But if you want to have the option of taking two hours, make sure you start it with at least two hours to go uh, before 11.59 p.m. Okay, that is it for today. Um, good luck on the exam, and we will see you next time.